Uh, we've not had a chance to meet before. My name is Aaron. I've got to be worshiping with you. Uh, and this is a hammer. Uh, but before we get into hammer time, oh, <laughs> before we get started, would you join me in a moment of silence while we quiet our hearts and minds and invite God's Spirit to be with us this morning? Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, we invite you into this room this morning to fill us with your power. We ask that you would give us insight into how you're at work in our lives and in the world around us. Would you strengthen us to be part of your design for creation? Would you be with us, convict us, inspire us, Remind us of your eternity-changing power. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Uh, anybody know the organization Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity? You heard that organization before? Habitat for Humanity? Okay. Anybody know about the Carter Project that happened this last week? Have you heard about this? Great. Anybody get a chance to volunteer at the Carter Project? Yes, no. Okay, well, I did. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, if you don't know, the Carter Project is a week-long intensive uh, run by the Habitat for Humanity where the aim is to build 30 homes in the span of a week. Uh, each day, a 1,000 volunteers came on site to build one of these homes. And my day was Wednesday, uh, and my job was to get uh, all harnessed up and to walk across the trusses and awkwardly grab sheets of plywood and lay them down and start hammering them in so that my teammates could come behind and start building walls. Um, and here it is, right? This is my hammer. It's a smallish hammer to be sure, but, well, watch. See? Still effective. The hammer, when it's properly wielded, is a powerful tool, right? Uh, it can break cinder blocks down into rubble, or it can build homes and decks and dislodge things that have gotten stuck. But, well, here, JD, can you come up here for a second? I'm going to use you as an example. <clears throat> okay, put your hand right here on the table. <laughs> Don't worry, this will only hurt a lot, and it will probably maim you for the rest of your life. So, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but thanks for trusting me with your life anyway. I'm going to grab the hammer. I'm going to grab this again. Thank you. But seriously, right? This is the thing about power. The same hammer that could build a cathedral is the same hammer that could just as easily smash, maim, uh, or even kill. That's the thing about power. Power can cultivate life or it can crush it. It can make communities blossom with creativity or it can crush them into lifeless uniformity. And we all have it, right? Whether we're a student or a scientist, an artist or an accountant, an Uber driver or unemployed, a parent or even a president, each of us has power, tremendous power. I mean, just check out the creation story in Genesis 1.27. Right at the beginning, we read, So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Right from the beginning, God imprinted God's likeness onto humanity. And then he goes, Genesis goes on to unpack what this actually means. 120, the very next verse. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. You see, right from the get-go, human beings are given this unique task of caring for God's world as rulers and leaders over creation. In other words, you and I were created to have influence and to wield power. We were not made to be impotent, to watch life pass us by while we sit quietly in the corners of irrelevance. We were each uniquely designed to partner with God and to work together to care for God's kingdom. We were made to use our time and talents and treasures to exercise God's creative rule over the earth. And deep inside, every human heart 
is this innate desire. The desire to succeed, to create beautiful and provocative art, to do great things and make a difference in our families, in our workplaces, and in the world. This proclivity to have influence and to make a difference, to have power, in other words, is actually part of what it means to bear the image of God. But for many of us, if not all of us, myself included, this God-given desire to do great things often gets warped into something ugly. Toxic blends of greed and fear and shame lead us to desire more power and more security, not for God or God's kingdom or even God's people, but for ourselves and for our own glory or even just for our own protection. Not being content to be like God, we try to actually be God. And so you use aggression or manipulation or coercion to create many kingdoms that we can rule as we seem fit. Kingdoms that we can order and control our environments and our relationships as we desire them. And you know what? Jesus knows this about humanity. And those who had come to listen to him at the foot of the mountain knew this too. They felt this reality every single day under the heavy heel of the Roman Empire. Now, we love to tromp on the Roman Empire and throw them as the bad guys all the time, and it's true. But for those at the top of the empire, the emperor and the senators and the ruling class, power meant that in theory anyway, they could organize and administer all kinds of good things for untold populations. And to some extent, that's exactly what they did. Those at the top of the power chain organized the building of great aqueducts that brought clean water to millions. They built incredible roadways, some of which are still being used today, that opened up new trade routes and distributed food more efficiently and effectively. The empire administered the distribution of news across their networks and the building of harbors and the establishment of new sewage systems that resulted in happier citizens who lived longer and stayed healthier pretty good use of power. In many ways, the empire used power to increase the quality of life for countless people. They used their power to create a lot of good. But the sad thing is, for all the good that they had done in society, the Roman Empire had this other thing it was known for, this thing it was thriving on, this thing that it was convinced would last forever, the power of the sword. The power of aggression, of eliminating any opposition to the world order that they had envisioned. Which meant that for so many people in that world, Roman power was not a good thing. And for those sitting at Jesus' feet, the people who were under the political and military oppression of the day, all Roman power meant to them was fear and tyranny and brutality. And knowing this full well, Jesus looks at his listeners and with compassion in his eyes says, The good life belongs to the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And if it was me listening, I'd be like, What? What did you say, Jesus? The meek? The good life belongs to the quiet and gentle and easily imposed upon? The good life belongs to the punching bags and pushovers? The good life belongs to the soft and spineless? Really, Jesus? Do you know what it's like to live down here in the trenches? Well, this morning, this morning we're continuing our sermon series on the Beatitudes that we're calling The Good Life. And together we're exploring Jesus' vision for the good life, the life as God designed, the hashtag blessed life. And today we're looking at that Beatitude, Blessed are the Meek. Now, right away, my first question is, who even uses this word anymore, right? I mean, when's the last time you used meek in a sentence? Hey, man, you should be more meek. Right? It's totally archaic. We never use it any longer. So my second question then is, why would anyone ever want to be considered meek if we know what it means? Because if you look up meekness in the thesaurus, you won't find a list of synonyms that sound very strong, right? Instead, you'll find words like mild and docile, timid, tame, passive, spineless, They're the compliant clams who just go in whatever direction anyone pushes. I love this cartoon. Uh, Hey, Tom, let's go rob a bank. Okay, if you say so. (laughs) Right? Compliant clams. That's what we think of when we think about meekness, right? So it's no wonder that no one wants to be considered meek. 
And yet Jesus describes meekness as one of the hallmarks of the best life. So what does he mean? What does it mean when he called us to model meekness? What does it look like to be meek? Now, the word meek was used in many different contexts in the ancient world, but when you take them all together, they paint a portrait of what meekness really means, and it's a little bit more nuanced than the way that we use the word today. Now, contrary to to popular belief today, the word meek does not mean that you disavow power. It doesn't mean that you fail to use power or even to be powerless. Instead, meekness at that day is power used for another's gain. Let me say that again. Power used for another's gain. That's meekness. Being meek doesn't mean that you ignore what's wrong or you let other people push others around. Meekness doesn't ignore evil or give in to it. It doesn't permit violence, nor does it seek vengeance. Meekness is the balance between too much and too little anger when responding to injustices. Meekness is the power to stand up for what's right without resorting to coercion or violence or manipulation. It's the ability to, disp- dis- blah, blah, blah. It's the ability to discipline a misbehaving child without resorting to screaming tirades or to shaming them. It's holding a subordinate accountable for their poor behavior, but doing so in such a way that the relationship is stronger and better and more alive because of the confrontation. It's the ability to say, this is wrong, or I disagree, or we won't go down that road. But to be able to do so without dehumanizing or destroying those who are making different choices than us. Meekness is the ability to stand strong in the face of evil while remaining above the brutality of the world. The meek person is the one who remains in control of themselves in facing evil and whose strength of spirit, passions, and power have been harnessed for the good of another. Meekness is the hammer in the hand of a carpenter rather than a murderer. And just in a few short years, this is exactly what the disciples will witness as a carpenter rides into Jerusalem on the back of a colt on his way to confront a world hell-bent on using power to crush and kill any opposition. For you see, Jesus wasn't interested in using Rome's oppressive kind of power for himself. He wasn't interested in choosing the many options available to him for self-preservation. Jesus was not interested in exalting himself. He wasn't interested in claiming his place among the great. He wasn't interested in using his privilege or power for his own advantage the way that we might. Instead, in love, Jesus would let go of all of his privileges. He let go of all of his options. Like a sheep led to the slaughter, he would go where the angry hands led him. He'd kneel before the oppressors when he was told to. He'd welcome the mockery of thorns when it was handed to him. He'd give up his dignity when his robes were taken from him. He'd hand over his reputation to the heckles of of his critics. And he'd go to the cross to be crucified. But here's the thing, right? And this is so important. Throughout that entire ordeal, Jesus never once, not for one moment, gives up his power. Not even on the cross. Jesus doesn't reject it, deny it, ignore it, or pretend it isn't there. He doesn't wait for someone else to come along and do something to fix things. Instead, Jesus was meek. Jesus kept his power under control And to the very end, used it on behalf of others. People like you and me. Jesus stood up to all the evil the world could possibly throw at him. All the sin, all the shame. And rather than using his power to bring the kind of violent salvation everyone else had expected that he would do, Jesus used his power to usher in a new kind of salvation that no one had ever dreamed possible. Rather than making other people his slaves, he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Rather than conquering the Romans, Jesus was instead interested in conquering sin and shame and fear. Rather than fighting his enemies with the weapons of the world, Jesus fought the evil in us and around us and among us by strengthening us to love our enemies and to care for them 
and to even die for them. And rather than dispatching his enemies to the grave on the battlefield, Jesus made death his enemy and defeated it forever by rising again from the dead. That is the power of meekness. And that's the power that Jesus has given to all of us when Jesus gave us the gift of his Holy Spirit. It is the power of this Holy Spirit alive inside us that overturns empires and outlasts the short-sighted ambitions of empire. It's the hammer of the Holy Spirit that breaks down obstacles like bitterness and disease, addiction, anger, envy, selfishness, and prejudice. It's the power of the Spirit that strengthens us to say no to temptation, to forgive those who've wronged us, to heal those who've hurt us, to love those who've persecuted us, and to pray for those who hated us. It's the power to stay seated in the front of the bus when others say your place is in the back. It's the power to stand against societal injustices by peacefully marching arm in arm from Selma to Montgomery, even though the empire says, disperse or be destroyed. That is the power of meekness. It's the power of love lived out in public. It's to be mighty on behalf of the other and to be empowered to do so even when, especially when, it's costly to ourselves. And it's the kind of power that will one day cover all the earth. It's a spiritual power that will never end and never be beaten, no matter how high the odds get stacked against us. Because at the end of all things, after my body grows weak and I wait for, with those who have gone before me in death, then, after my watch has ended, Jesus will one day return at the end of history and calling us all out of the grave will finally set the world to right forever as it's supposed to be. And it will be the meek. It will be the meek. Those who follow Jesus by laying down their lives for others. It will be the meek who hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. It'll be the meek, those who put their hope in Jesus and lived out his love in public, who will inherit the renewed and resurrected earth forever. And so the question is, what kind of power will you choose? The power of self-preservation or self-denial? The power to take or the power to give? Will you use the hammer to crush or to create, to destroy, or to build. And I ask because one day, one day we'll all have to figure this out in our own contexts. One day we'll all find ourselves with the hammer in our hand. One day we'll all find ourselves in a position where we're faced with options before us and have to make a decision, a tough decision, a decision about end-of-life care, or the termination of an employee, or confronting the friend or family member that have been making self-destructive choices. And on that day, you'll be waiting and waiting for someone else around you to make the tough call. But in that moment, as you lift up your eyes from staring at the floor, and as you look around the room, you'll wake up and realize that every set of eyes are actually staring straight at you. You'll look up and find that you're the one that has the final say. You're the one who has the most influence. You're the one with the hammer. And when that day comes, what will you do with it? How will you use your power in those moments? Now before we go on, let me take a risk here. I'm going to say one word about meekness to my fellow white brothers in the room. For lots of complex and historical geopolitical reasons, you and I were born with a sledgehammer's worth of power in our hands just by virtue of being white and male and alive in the 21st century. Yes, there has been some progress for women and people of color in our country over the years, but that doesn't change the fact that, relatively speaking, we have stupendous economic, social, and political power just because we were born. Regardless of where we are or what our struggles have been, because of course we've all had our own struggles, the difference is 
put any other race or gender in the exact same position with the exact same history as you or I, and their future prospects will be materially disadvantaged compared to ours. Which means of all the people in the room, the burden of pursuing meekness today falls most heavily on our shoulders. It's our job to be meek, to use our social, economic, and political power to pick fights against injustices and prejudice and the disparity of opportunities that we see all around us and to do so on behalf of our neighbors. It's our job to use the hammer to break down glass ceilings that exist for others, even if and especially when that's costly to ourselves. I know it's uncomfortable to think about it. None of us asked to be born with that sledgehammer in our hands. But my white brothers, it's the truth of where we are today. And I want you to seriously consider this morning what you will do with a hammer that you were born with. Will you advocate for your, the, your women colleagues or ethnically underrepresented office mates to get promoted instead of you, maybe? And then, if it should happen, will you celebrate them and advocate for them after the fact? When in positions of power and soliciting business, will you look to the biggest names in business or will you give that contract to the smaller, black-owned business? Will you commit to speaking last in the team meeting, considering and asking what your women colleagues think before voicing your own opinion and interrupting theirs? White brothers, in our culture today, you and I were born with a hammer in our hands. How Will we use it? Will we use our power to build others up even when it's costly to ourselves or will we crush others around us and so maintain the status quo? Now this is not about being a savior and doing something for someone else that they could do for themselves if given the opportunity. It's about getting out of the way so that others can have an opportunity. Meekness is about choosing to listen before talking. It's about taking a loss so that others can have a gain. Asking before answering, empathizing before judging. So I ask again, will you be meek in your approach to power? Because here's the thing, and this is true for all of us, man or women, every ethnicity and every generation. So if you've tuned out, now's the time to come back. How we think about power affects everything about us in life. It affects how we handle our finances, how we handle our friends, our families. It shapes the way that we lead and work and parent. It affects how we treat our bosses or our subordinates or our teachers or our students. It affects how we respond to responsibilities and commitments. It guides how we react to adversity and injustices. What will you do with the hammer that you have? Will you be meek? Will you use your power for others' gain? Here's what this has looked like for me. This is the first and probably the only time I'll talk about this up front. But for eight years, I was the lead and planting pastor at a church in Massachusetts called Anchor Bay. With that job came a lot of responsibility and a hugely disproportionate amount of influence in people's lives. Not to mention that I was the boss for a whole team of people and had the final say of most of what happened around there. I had the final oversight over the preaching schedule, the content of the sermons, the order of worship, and the kids' church curriculum. Constitutionally, I had the power both to hire and fire anyone on staff that I wanted to or needed to. Technically, I could have preached every week. I could have decided what songs we sang every Sunday and required donuts to be served every hour during coffee hour. That was a lot of power. And when we started that church, a friend of mine put the question to me plainly and asked, so, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to handle that kind of power? And as I thought about it and reflected on it, it became pretty clear pretty quickly to me that as far as it depends on me, I wanted to use my power to open doors for others. I wanted to give people opportunities that they might not otherwise get, opportunities that they might have otherwise had to fight for. I wanted to be a meek leader. Now, if you talk to anybody on my staff, they'll tell you God knows that I did not do that perfectly all the time, even most of the time, maybe. There were loads of times that I was guilty of overreach or anxious micromanaging or cultural insensitivities. 
Sometimes I got envious when other people got the accolades that I might have gotten if I would have kept the limelight on myself. But in the core of my being, I wanted to be meek, to use my power to encourage and strengthen and empower others. I wanted to use my position to hold the door open for people who might not otherwise have had doors open for them as easily or naturally. That's why when I was at the helm at Anchor Bay, we committed early on to have 50% of our Sundays have a woman preacher in the pulpit. It's why almost half of our worship songs were written by members of our own community. It's why we had 24 first-time preachers in those first eight years that we existed. And my favorite part about all that, 18 of those 24 first-time preachers were women or people of color. I wanted to create an environment where people could create something new together and try leadership for the first time and to take risks and be able to safely fail without it being fatal. And sometimes, sometimes that worked out smashingly beautiful. And other times I failed spectacularly. But even so, as long as Anchor Bay was on my watch, I wanted to use the hammer I had to fan into flame the gifts of God I saw in others. In the same way, this is why I'm now working as a nonprofit banker with Bremer Bank as opposed to an investment banker with like Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or whoever. See, I understand that money is a form of portable power. And in my job today, I get to advocate and steward the limited resources from depositors like you to organizations that are doing kingdom-adjacent work here in the Twin Cities and across the state. I get to use my power to make sure resources flow to critical social infrastructure supporting the most marginalized populations and to make sure that we help them not just stay alive, but to thrive. So there you go. That's the first and probably last time you'll hear me talk about this, but it seemed like it was an important way to give an illustration. This is how I try to think about the hammer that I have in my hand. So what about you? What will it look like for you to choose meekness and to use your power for others' gain? Maybe for you it means using your relational power to stand in the gap and to mediate between two sides that have been in a fight for a long time. Maybe you can notice the person neglected at lunch or after class and simply ask them to join you during yours. Maybe for you it means mentoring someone younger or someone less experienced, even if that means stepping out of the limelight so that they can have opportunities to lead you. Maybe for you that means forgiving someone who has wronged you and releasing the power to make them pay. Or maybe for you, maybe today, you're coming here and you don't feel very powerful at all. Healing, renewal, restoration, opportunity, stability, these feel like a million miles out of your reach with little power at all to make any real changes. But friends, if that's you, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died to put a hammer in your hands, a hammer that we know as the Holy Spirit. The good news of the gospel is that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us which means that we actually can now do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And the healing or renewal that we crave is a guaranteed yes in Jesus, even if we don't see it until the day he comes back to right all wrongs and restore all things. So I ask you again, where is it that God is inviting you to use the power you have in the world? in your neighborhood, in your community, at your home, or among your friends. Because here's what I know. Jesus used his phenomenal cosmic power not to be served, but to serve. To show the full extent of his love and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus shared his Holy Spirit with us so we can go out and do the exact same thing. The greatest power in the history of the world is the power of the Holy Spirit right now alive in us. The resurrecting power of God that comes from God and is at work inside us, empowering us to do things we might not ever wise thought possible. Is it terrifying and challenging and painful sometimes? You bet. Is it also beautiful and worthy of song and story and celebrating for all of eternity? 1,000%.
So no matter who you are, no matter what your background, when we follow Jesus, we are given power, power that Jesus invites us to use for others' gain, just like he did and does and will again for our eternal gain. Now, does that sound weak to you? Hardly. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are the one who can move mountains. You're the one who does move mountains. You're the one who makes the impossible possible. The one who restores all broken things to rightness. The one who fixes all broken relationships into rightness. The one who restores all prejudice and injustices back into balance. And Jesus, so we lift up you and we praise you this morning and we ask, we beg you that your spirit might give us the power of meekness, the power to stand strong against injustices like you did, but to do so in a way that brings life and healing and unity and renewal and joy for all time. Jesus, give us your eyes. Spirit, give us your strength. Jesus, we love you and we know that these things will be true whether in our life or the next. And so we lift up this time to you and we praise you, love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. It's in your powerful name that we pray and say all these things. Amen.